Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Back with you on a Monday. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We got you set up tonight for the national championship game. You're out running errands. You got to go get diapers. Maybe your fridge is empty or you're picking up a pizza. ESPN Lincoln, baby, has uh, all the pregame coverage and game action on Westwood One. So it is Carolina. It is Kansas. Just like Elijah Herbal picked it. Am I right? So I picked Duke or I picked North Carolina. I'm going to have to rewind the tape. I don't even remember. No, I, I'm giving you, like, completely, without checking any facts at all, credit to sound very, very big time. Well, I appreciate you just, you that. You just say, yeah, that's right. I had Kansas and Carolina. Because well, that's, quite frankly, that's that's a common championship game pick i definitely did not, not this have year it. maybe but i didn't have it preseason or pre, uh, pre-tournament whatsoever but on friday i thought like you know what could happen right. <laughs> fast forwarding to narrowing down to just four 50 50 shot you get it right yeah yeah a boom so we will check in get the rundown here on kansas carolina also a, a close friend of coach k the aftermath of what saturday night was Tom Pender is with us at 525. Mr. Blackshirt, Charlie McBride, a Monday with Charlie. Get coaches take as spring uh, football nears an end. We'll hear from Scott Frost shortly on the formatics of Saturday. And in, a, in about 20 minutes or so, Greg Smith, recruiting insider with HaleVarsity.com and Magazine. Get his take on the visitors list and what Saturday really is about. I know it's the final spring go for nebraska but it is showcase time it is energy time it is fan base advertisement time I mean, it's all of those things to help make a lasting impression for some kids that could help uh, in future years numbers to dial up get involved with this today on Hale Varsity Radio, 466-3776-800-825-5865. Find us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio. Chris Schmidt at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. And you can email Chris at HaleVarsity.com. You coming into town. If you're in Lincoln, come see us Friday, 4 to 6. We are... Uh, down at the single barrel inside the graduate. We love posting up down there. Great steaks, great beer, great everything. So we're down there on Friday. And then uh, we'll have a little bit later weekend edition, but it'll still be rocking as you can get that uh, that breakfast at the single barrel. Get your tummy full before you go do your thing at the spring game, 930 to 1130 Saturday. Uh, we are at the single barrel inside the graduate so come see us, say hi. I've got plenty of goodies to uh, to hand out for you. Need a koozie? Got you covered. Need some beads? Don't have to do anything gross. I will hand them out willingly. <laughs> uh, but uh, we've got some uh, some fun stuff uh, going on Friday, Saturday with Hale Varsity Road Shows, 4 to 6, and then 9.30 to 11.30. Oh, it, so, it should be noted, if you do want to do some gross things for your beads, I'm your guy. Yeah, well, Elijah will be conspicuously locked up in studio for one of those days. So let's start off with a little basketball. And who are you rooting for Saturday? Did you have a little nostalgia? Did you have a little twinge of, well, wouldn't it be a great story if, if Coach K got to the championship game? Were you Coach K'd out? I wasn't Coach K'd out. But I was getting <laughs> – the dial was moving that direction. And for, for Hubert Davis and Carolina to do what they did is flat-out incredible. Uh, just an awesome game. I was over at Coach Burt's house with some Carolina fans and just big shot after big shot. Not necessarily great shot after great shot, but they went in. And it was, uh, it was pretty impressive. As good a game – 
as you want to see. I don't know that you'll get that tonight. That's the hope, right? You get more memorable wow moment games in this tournament. You've had Cinderella. You've had upsets. You've had blue bloods. And you get the the blue bloodiest of of teams. It's Kansas and Carolina. So it's Bill Self v. Hubert Davis and droopy dog Roy Williams somewhere in a camera shot. So we'll get there. Some great insight coming up, I do believe, from Tom Penders. Uh, Nebraska basketball making a hire. And uh, we'll get to meet uh, assistant coach Adam Howard tomorrow. Uh, noon presser set up at uh, Bob Devaney with Coach Hoiberg. Uh, Howard recently the associate head coach at South Alabama. Four years in Mobile, uh, 75 and 51. Pair of 21 seasons. And you have a guy that has coached and had success at lower levels, smaller programs, smaller conferences. But uh, not only is it going to be a pay bump for him, but he loves the opportunity. And it's not a sure thing, quite frankly. Uh, this is a this is an opportunity where you get a bump, you get a coach in in Power Five ball, and uh, he is excited about it. This has got to be a guy that can go recruit the Sun Belt region, uh, can can develop guys. I love the fact that Armand Gates is here. Uh, you have uh, Howard, a native of Kentucky, Western Kentucky grad from '04 through '08, and uh, in his four years there, you're talking. Damn near 25 wins a season when he was uh, there. Uh, One NCAA tournament, two NITs for him. So uh, Nebraska moving forward. Uh, Sounds like Fred liked what Howard can do and said, let's let's make a move. And uh, and there you have it. So that's good news for uh, Nebraska. They can get to work. I will say. Among like people who were writing like oh, shortlist candidates for uh, assistant coaching, I did not see this guy once. Uh, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Uh, I, I just don't know if there's any previous relationship between uh, between Hoiberg and, and him. I guess we'll find out a little bit more whenever he's introduced about that. Uh, I, I personally didn't know who this guy was. I, I looked into the resume, though. Convincing resume. He's really had success everywhere he's mm-hmm. gone, except I believe his his stop at Tennessee. They had a so so's year, but he was only there for one year. And, and look up that Tennessee year. Was that the Bruce Pearl is banished from college basketball season? Possibly 2015, 2016, before Bruce Pearl resurfaces on ESPN and then eventually Auburn. Uh, I'm thinking that may be it. Uh, this is this is previous. He, he made it till 2012 at Tennessee. Okay. Oh, which wow. is earlier than I thought. I, I thought it was earlier too. You just know that. And God love Bruce Pearl, entertainer, good coach, uh, proven recruiter by any means. <laughs> now it's okay with with NIL. And what what you do have? Uh, there's a little bit of a connection here, I would think, with Doc, just because of of the Southern Miss stop. Doc was at Southern Miss, not at the same time, mind you, but there's got to be some some common threads there. So he, that that staff was the first Rick Barnes staff at okay. Tennessee that he was on. Not the best results that year, but it kind of set the table for the success well, they had down the road. They finished the year 15 and 19. Yeah, Rick Barnes is, you know, he's a guy that doesn't get it done in the tournament, but he gets it done in the regular season and has the best camping jokes, ask Dolman sometime, ever. So, there you have it for Nebraska basketball. Husker baseball getting it handled. So, let us, let us ask this question. We'll catch up with our friend Jabba Chamberlain this week. Get his take on Big Red Baseball. So, you have an, an, an aggressive Nebraska team. 17-5 to yesterday. Back-to-back games with grand slams. Lots of innings with crooked numbers. Most importantly, lots of two-out scoring and hitting. And with Nebraska, they were 10-19. for 19. Uh, with two outs and eight for 21 with runners in scoring position. Uh, those have been brutal statistics and categories for Coach Bolton Company up until the Ohio State weekend. 13 of Nebraska's runs came with two outs on Sunday. They, they, were, they were aggressive, and they were also selective. Ten walks yesterday. So time will tell if Nebraska's actually turned the corner. I'm not going to say they turned the corner because they beat a bad Ohio State team, or at least an Ofer Ohio State team. Michigan was swept by uh, Iowa, so Iowa's kind of puffing their chest out right now. 
But quite frankly, uh, this is a step in the right direction. You had some of your, your dudes do their work. You had Griffin Everett breaking a 3-3 tie with a two-out RBI double to right center in the fourth. Nebraska really got some momentum and kept it, uh, which is great. Max Anderson had himself a weekend, which is nice. And that's that's big. So is Nebraska just beating up on a team that's throwing batting practice? I will not sneeze at it because Nebraska needed to do this to somebody at some time. So that's a good thing. You got UNO Wednesday, and then you got Rutgers, who's been pounding the baseball coming in this weekend. Maybe yeah, you, you keep reaching for a moment and a turning point. Maybe this gets Nebraska hot, and maybe they keep going. The good news is, is you're going to need to finish top two in the Big Ten and then probably go win the tournament, okay? That's just what I see postseason being a reality. That's how you get there. A lot to ask. I get it. But I just don't know if you get more than two to maybe three teams at this point. I mean, right now you want you Iowa and Maryland, right? I mean, those, those are your squads right now for Big Ten baseball. So, And, and I, I'll, I'll throw Rutgers in that list but not for I mean, more than three you, you you would need more like quality of opposition to, to to see what they have but there's a chance for them if they can keep it going you know sure but take the you know move them out of the way if you're nebraska baseball and mm-hmm. and, and and supplant them but right now at least you're two games over 500 in conference and get back to 500 overall and then just go do some work and and be in contention and and maybe make it happen uh, with uh, with the Big Ten season. At least they're taking steps and making hits in clutch moments. And you said time will tell if this is uh, uh, an opportunity for Nebraska, Nebraska to turn the or they beat a bad team. They they don't have to wait that long to figure it out because you're going to know by this weekend. This this Rutgers team is. I mean, from what we've seen this year, they're solid. They might not be a top three team in the Big Ten, but they at least have talent. They mm-hmm. hit the ball really well. Um, but the most encouraging sign from Nebraska this weekend to me was they they endured tough times and, and came out on top. Friday night, you struck out 14 times in the first seven innings, mm-hmm. and you still got the win. On, on Sunday, your starter gives up five runs in four innings, and you still go and get the win. They, they, they made it through tough times, got the win, uh, showing some more resiliency and some more, more fight at the plate. Well, they, and they'd been just scuffling. I mean, baseball's so mental, can screw with you, and uh, good for Nebraska. Husker football, spring game. So the, the attitude and kind of the, the, uh, the mood is, eh, you're just not that amped or jacked for the spring game. I think as you, you get closer to Saturday at 1, you'll be all right. I think the weather's going to be good Saturday. I know Friday, Thursday, it's going to be a little chillier, a little cloudier, at least in Lincoln. But format-wise, this is this will be interesting. If it's just going to be offense, defense, you know that'll be all right. You just don't know what you're going to be able to learn about this team and take with you, quite honestly, because so many guys have been dinged up. Um, this is Coach Frost. What what the what the discussion is right now with the format of the game uh, for the fans. But uh, above all, what are you going to get out of that last padded t- full tackle practice that'll be on BTN at one o'clock? Well, we got to finalize that first. You know, I, I, if if it's at all possible, I want to have two teams playing a game. Um, if, if it isn't that, we're going to make it. Uh, competitive and fun doing it a different way and we have to talk about that as a staff and with the training staff um, but if it's offense defense that just, I just want to see more of the same I want to see good execution and fundamentals on both sides that's fair this is about improvement this is about development we'll hear from some of the newcomers today Tommy Hill Trey Palmer got to be in front of the media uh, also, Anthony Grant as well. So that was pretty insightful. And those guys bring a whole crazy level and a great way of competition. I mean, they, they have brought that with them, it feels like, uh, time in, time out, in practice. More from Frost here on Trey Palmer and just kind of what he's injected into the receiver room and uh, his mentality, how it's rubbed off. Trace for- Trace fit great, and he fits in great because of his personality. Uh, he brings energy every single day. Um, he's made a lot of plays out there. He can really run. So uh, I think with some more time working with him, he has a chance to do some special things, and, and looking forward to seeing that development. 
I think when Nebraska fans want to see whether it's a red versus white or an offense versus defense, if you're a defensive guy, and we'll talk to Coach McBride here in less than an hour, there's no way he wants to see any successful run game. Flipping it around, I think it's going to be pretty vital for Nebraska to live where they want to live in the Big Ten to get the run game going downhill and be consistent with it more from Frost here. And that's the one thing I think you can take with you from the beginning of spring to now is, uh, by all accounts, head coach, tight end coach, offensive line coach, running backs coach, defensive side of the football, they've all given appropriate kudos, not overboard, not gushing, but they've said, look, the, the run game's been better. Uh, can it be that way in Ireland here the end of August? You know, we've been at or, at or near the top of rushing in the Big Ten quite a few years. I think we can be better, and, and that's one area I really do see improvement um, with the way the line's blocking and the way the backs are hitting it. A, a combination of um, efficient run blocking and, and and talent and vision in the back end helps that. Um, you can scheme as many things up as you want, and at the end of the day, you got to block it well, and, and you got to have a back that can hit it. And uh, I, I do see vast improvement in those areas. We'll get some eyewitness accounts from uh, Tommy Hill on the, the run game. Who's showing up for the spring game? Recruiting showcase time. Greg Smith answers that next with Hale Barn City Radio. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Don't forget Roadshow Friday ahead of the spring game at the Single Barrel. And then special weekend edition time, 9.30, 11.30. Also at the Single Barrel, single barrel to get your breakfast game going uh, before kickoff. We say hi to Greg Smith. Uh, at Greg Smith HV on Twitter, recruiting insider with Hale Varsity. Greg, it's uh, coming down to its end, man. The uh, final week here at Spring Ball that the exclamation point will be, well, we used to call it the red-white scrimmage, maybe not. <laughs> what do you think of the potential <laughs> format shift for Nebraska on Saturday? Yeah, it, it kind of it seems like Scott Frost, as he kind of explained that, I was a little deflated by even the, the proposal of per, perhaps doing just an offense-defense uh, type of a game. Um, and hopefully they're, they're able to find a way to not do it. And like he said, do kind of two teams and have kind of a real game. Uh, because was it the, la- the last was it last year's spring game where there was no tackling in the first half? There was like yep. two-hand touch. Um, we've had some weird ones, right? So it would be nice to have one that, that's just a normal, straight-up spring game. Greg, the the best spring game ever was the one of the Great Flood where it was canceled, and <laughs> I had tickets to that one. I was yeah, disappointed. I, I ended up on O Forgot Street. Forgot all about that. I ended up on O Street forever. It was wonderful. It, um, it crushed my little ten year old heart. <laughs> <laughs> it's been that long ago. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm was, getting that old. was like what 2011 probably. Oh I, was, I was in. Sixth grade, I think. Fifth okay. or sixth grade. Greg, oh, we, great. We're, we're getting great. old, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. man. Thanks. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Well, hey, the spring game has shifted to the, the, the showcase part. I mean, it is about visitors. It is about unofficials. It is about the, uh, the 500-mile radius guys and some other guys coming in. Really, what, what can Nebraska do with kids that are on campus now? And th- that peer recruiting element also uh, just where the program's at right now. Nebraska really is drilled down, and they've got quite a list uh, coming in here this Saturday. Yeah, they absolutely do. And I, I, I was it, it was interesting today, I was part of a media roundtable with, with director, senior director of player personnel, uh, Vince Guinta, um, and he talked about this very thing, about the idea that this weekend is going to be one of the biggest weekends that Nebraska has had for a spring game. Um, and that a lot of those kids that you mentioned from kind of that 500-mile radius are guys that actually this is going to be their second or third time coming to campus, which is a really, really good idea um, and a good sign for Nebraska's chances of continuing to push forward in their recruitment uh, because, again, the 500-mile radius is loaded. I think that under uh, his leadership um, and Scott Frost kind of changing kind of directions here, it does make it to where Nebraska right now is really trying to lean more heavily on that 500-mile radius. And it feels like we say it a lot, but as you continue to watch the talent from this area go around college football um, and have good careers, you need to tap into more of that for Nebraska. Um, and it sounds like they really want to do that this weekend. 
Greg, give me, give me the big board of guys that, that are that are at the top of the list for this Husker coaching staff. Maybe, maybe the, the top three guys where you think, uh, all right, the coaches are, are going to be really recruiting these guys hard this weekend. They're, they're probably most important. Yeah, well, so I, a couple of guys, um, it just all classes, probably the number one guy, well, the number one guy, actually, I should say, is Ojai Mathis. It's the transfer uh, from TCU, the, the edge rusher. Um, the Nebraska desperately needs pass rush. Um, not necessarily a traditional recruit, but a transfer that everybody's going to want to know about. Um, after that, Dylan Rayola is going to be a guy that's going to get an enormous amount of attention, attention this weekend um, as well. You know, the five-star quarterback for the 2024 class. Um, obviously, with strong ties to the program, um, I haven't confirmed him 100 percent yet. But if Malachi Coleman ends up um, on the campus, he's going to be another guy uh, that really gets a ton of attention. Um, there's just a lot of guys. Another four-star edge player out of Texas, Trey Wilson, is someone who'll get a lot of attention. Um, Nebraska is going to have a really deep list of players this weekend um, that they're going to have to juggle and, and figure out how to make everybody feel special. Forecast me about Mathis is Texas the leader just because of coach gary being down there on staff as an analyst or does nebraska have a puncher's chance here for for mathis yeah i think nebraska has a solid chance here and and really texas and and texas is the only other school that i'm aware of that he's actually taken an official visit to he'll be on an official uh this weekend to nebraska um, obviously, he's not, he has not like gone out and kind of done, you know, been wine and dined by everybody out here. Um, so I think Texas and Nebraska might be the top two schools. I do think that Texas was an early leader, but Nebraska has a heck of a chance this weekend uh, to really make up some ground and, and should make a compelling case as to why you, know, you see, you know, 50,000, 60,000 people at the spring game. Imagine what this is going to be like in the fall. And oh, by the way, we desperately need a pass rusher like you. Um, and I think Nebraska could could present a really good case there. You mentioned uh, Mathis and then Wilson, of course, out of Garland, Texas. Just a he's a he's a top two hundred uh, composite guy. I mean, high high yep. recruit uh, again, an outside linebacker. So, talk to me about who the lead will be for for Mathis and for Wilson. Right? Who are, who are the the peers and? Who are the coaches? Is it going to be Dawson? Is it going to be uh, Mickey? Is it going to be Bush? I mean, both you know, Bush and Mickey have gone big game hunting before and done well. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's a great question about the player host. I think that's a really key component here. I think with Mathis, I think you've got to put him with Casey Thompson. I think that that has to be um, the deal there. Um, you could go – with another defensive player, but it, it's not. It's a such a good comparison to have him go with just another really high-profile transfer that came in and can really speak to what was happening there. I think that Applewhite um, could end up being the guy that's the lead coach there, but then of course you'll have Mike Dawson mm-hmm. kind of pop in um, and do his thing as well. I, I think with the other guys like Wilson. I think you really want to have Mickey Joseph involved with that because, like you said, they, he has such good experience of reeling in these big time guys. Um, but eventually, you are just, you're going to have to have Mike Dawson involved too, um, and he does well with some of those kids with X's and O's as well. But I think you kind of take a team effort um, in that case, and then maybe Jamari Butler as a player host um, that he can really talk to and connect with uh, as a guy who's kind of stuck it out and is just trying to have it be his time right now. Greg, remind me here, if, if O'Shawn Mathis does come away impressed with what he sees in the spring game Saturday, what does the, the scholarship count look like for this Husker football team right now? Is there room for him as it stands, or there have to be departures? Oh, boy, I, that's, that's a good question. That is always a moving target. Um, and, and I truly, I don't know the exact count, but they will have room for him because they will make room for him, um, even if you know they're not under the scholarship limit. Remember, they just got to be at 85 by, by August. Um, they've got plenty of time to do that, so they'll, they'll find a way to make it happen because I think one of the things that we're going to see um, for Nebraska next week and for other schools as they finish up their spring games, you're going to see guys depart teams and more scholarships open up. So I, I don't think that's a concern at all right now. Greg, uh, how's your feel with the quarterback spot? And we've, we've heard good reviews on the Whipple offense We've not had the opportunity to see practice. We know Smothers has been healthy. We know Harburg's been healthy. And then John Thompson's been taking the snaps. And uh, do you feel like there's been much of a, of a competition? 
No, no, I don't. I don't think there has been, and I'm not sure that that was. I don't think that that was necessarily by design. Um, I think that Chubba Purdy's injury and how that's limited him a lot this spring. I mean, I think this, just this past late last week um, was when he really started getting into his first live work. I think that him not being able to be in that competition um, kind of hurt the overall, you know, kind of an ability for them to really push Casey Thompson. I think that Logan Smothers is probably doing some good things, but he just doesn't have the same arm talent um, as Casey Thompson. And I think that not that Casey hasn't necessarily earned it, because I think he has come in and done all the things that you want him to do. He hasn't acted like the job was just handed to him. He's done. He's had good re- leadership. He's really gotten into the playbook. But I do think that if you're Coach Frost, you probably wanted to keep him a little sharper or on edge about whether or not he was going to win that job, even though Frost said today that, you know, we'll announce it when it's apparent to everybody um, and, and it's clear cut. Any word or feelers out with Malachi Coleman how Oregon's weekend was? Uh, I do not know that yet. Um, I will put some feelers out um, on that, though. But, but, I mean, again, Oregon is always impressive, right? When you go out there and you visit, and we've seen guys from around here go out there um, and, 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 you know, obviously sign with them. Um, uh, Avante Dickerson, Devin Jackson come to mind, obviously, right away. Um, that's an impressive school. They've got great facilities, a lot of energy around that new coach. Um, but I do need to also find out where they offered him at, right? Is it's been all over the board uh, for what position different colleges see him at. Georgia likes him at outside linebacker, Nebraska at um, receiver, other teams at tight end. Um, so that'll be interesting, too, because ultimately he's going to have a decision to make there as well. Tell me a little bit about Noonan, where he's at. Uh, the, of course, the, the legacy uh, – Danny, the the great player for for Nebraska, of course, Maverick Noonan, the interior uh, lineman, uh, just up the road here, 50 miles, and I know Stanford's offered him. Where is Nebraska in the dance with with Maverick? Yeah, I think Nebraska's in a good spot here, but one of the really interesting things is for a, for a guy that's as high profile in the state, at least, um, with his recruitment, and he's been kind of a really good regional recruit right now that I think is starting to get uh, more notoriety outside the region. As you mentioned, that, that Stanford offer, his recruitment has been pretty quiet, right? I think he's kind of gone about his business in a really quiet way. He has not done a lot of interviews, hasn't talked a lot about his process. Uh, but the thing is with him is I do know that he wants to early enroll, so I know he'd like to have a decision made this summer if possible. Uh, but Nebraska is in a good position with him. Um, and I know that Nebraska is trying to get him on campus for the spring game this weekend. Greg, two or three guys that maybe aren't uh, as high on the radar uh, with with the fan base, but a couple of, couple of names that you're intrigued by, either local or regional, that maybe we haven't touched on yet. Yeah, I think that one uh, defensive lineman out of Iowa for the 2023 class, David Borchers, um, is a kid that I'm really interested in. He's about 6'3", 270. Um, kind of a, it's weird to say this about a kid that's already 270, but he's a little bit of a tweener. Um, could play either more of that defensive tackle that had that kind of traditional 4-3 role or beef up some and play uh, the base defensive end. Uh, he'll be here this weekend, and I think Nebraska's in a really good spot with him. Um, I am interested now as we continue to move through spring, and I don't think this was the case um, coming into spring at tight end. Like, what does Nebraska do for tight end uh, for the 2023 class? And Zach Orwith um, is a kid out of St. Louis who's also going to be in town this weekend. Uh, but I think that he might be one to watch as well is that that position you talk about spots where the portal could be evolving here you're gonna have to check on health of some guys after this spring to see if nebraska needs another body um in a tight end and if they need to go after one or two for the 2023 class greg smith with us recruiting insider hailvarsity.com and magazine at greg smith hv on twitter greg will have the uh the official official list here uh, as it's a, a fluid thing. And Greg will have the updates for you. And, of course, the recap with all the kids that were in uh, Lincoln for Saturday. Greg, will run you down uh, maybe later in the week, and we'll see you for sure Saturday. But thanks so much. Yeah, sounds good. Hey, go enjoy that weather. <laughs> you too. Greg, that means Greg's opening the grill right now. Tommy Hill, his take on spring next. Chime in, 402-466-ESPN, or email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. As the uh, format 
for the spring game could be uh, an offense versus defense. We shall see how that shakes out. Good stuff today from Coach Frost and some of the players, Anthony Grant, uh, Trey Palmer, we'll hear from momentarily. And uh, Tommy Hill uh, opened up here uh, quite a bit uh, about his his personality, quite honestly, and just what you have guys coming from different programs. But Elijah, doesn't it sound like, and, and guys got to prove it on the field, obviously, but it, it feels like guys are super confident coming in when you listen to the Palmers, when you listen to the Tommy Hills, when you uh, when you listen to the Anthony Grants. Not quite cocky, but just confident in their ability, and, and they like how they've meshed with their teammates, but they like the talent on the team. And obviously time will tell with that. I, I don't feel like there's any time I've, I've listened to a Nebraska team since I've started working this show where I've been like, man, they sound really un, uh, unconfident in themselves right now. Like it's never really felt like that. However, there is a, a different kind of confidence that, that feels like it's surrounding, especially the newcomers. Um, like you, you listen to the the wide receiver room, some of those guys, and they seem really confident in, in the coaching they're getting from Mickey Joseph. Uh, you hear from the defensive guys and uh, they, they took that, that, those performances from last season where they played really well as, as a unit and it's turned into to more confidence this year of a, of a next man up type of mentality. So while, while I don't think previous teams have lacked confidence, the confidence this year does feel different. Well, it's more vocal. They're not afraid to kind of tell you what, what they think and how they're going about their business. Case in point, Tommy Hill, uh, he spent some time talking about the battles The battles he has waged in spring ball against a guy like Trey Palmer. And, I mean, take a listen for yourself. Oh, it's a dog against a dog. So, yes, sir, it's a dog against a dog always. Every every receiver I line up against, they're going to get the best out of me. So, that's the best. There's that mentality of just wanting to dominate and beat the guy across from you. Easier said than done when you get to that level of college ball, but you're gonna you're you're gonna win some, you're gonna lose some, but you're not gonna lose confidence if you do get beat. You're just gonna try and rally and get better. Goes back to the back and forth that Whipple's touched on, Becton's touched on, Frost has talked about, uh, Chenander's hit on. We'll get to uh, McBride in about 15 minutes, Coach. I mean. And he'll be able to give you case in point, some of the best teams they had, it wasn't one side of the ball ruling the spring or a week of practice. You need that to to sharpen one another. Uh, More from Tommy Hill on his uh, favorite part of playing cornerback, and that's uh, being able to lock somebody up, the man, the man, the island that uh, he's earned, at least in spring ball, that trust from Coach Fisher. I like man. So I like being on the island. Coach Fish, you know, he uh, put in a dime package for me on the island. So, he you know, he trusts me on the opposite field. He trusts me just going against the best one, and I trust myself. It's just a mindset. It's a, a dog mentality. Kobe, Kobe Bryant, uh, build off of him, uh, how he come to the game and play. Even when he's sick, hurt, anything, he try to play at his best ability. So, yeah, go uh, go dom- dominate your competition. Tommy Hill uh, giving us uh, – some reviews on Anthony Grant, the Nebraska run game. Grant's the name you've heard a lot about. You've you've seen a slimmed down Yant, of course. And then there's Ramir Johnson. Those are the three guys. A.J. Allen uh, set to come this summer, of course. And uh, you have... You have Gabe Irvin still working his way Gabe back Gabe Irvin's a guy that's, that's suited up but really not had much contact. So you want to see... Uh, Gabe Irvin that's healthy and confident. That's what you're concerned about is guys that have injuries to that degree. Can they come back and trust their their surgery? And they should, but it's easier said than done when you got to go out there and do it, actually. More on Tommy Hill when he's talking about Anthony Grant. Oh, yeah. yeah every time he busts a gap, he gone. So I'll be, I'll be trying to get him. But that's, that's a dog right there. I admit it. That's a dog. He got vision, shifty, speed. Uh, he got a lot of vision. I give him that, a lot of vision. I talk to him about he got a lot of vision. Like, I see him hit the gap when it's not even developed yet. So, yeah, he got vision. 
the offense has missed a, a game breaker. And again, going back to a Zigbo, and it's not that Ramir didn't have some big plays. Ramir made some big plays in the run game, but more so kind of out of the backfield catching the football. Uh, when you look at some of the, the largest or the biggest gash plays that went to the house, think the Michigan game on the wheel route. Nebraska needs that in their running game arsenal, and it's been Ziggy. It's been since Divino Zigbo that you've had a guy just absolutely on the ground be able to take the top off. Think about Nebraska's greatest moments in the run game, and guys like LP, guys like Amon, guys like Kenny Clark, or Mike Rogier, or Jeff Smith, or I mean, or from my era, Amir Abdullah. Well, Amir was awesome. And Amir would would go get you 260 against Miami, but he'd also have a 40 yard run, or he or he, or he'd have the big play opportunity, or he'd put the team on his back against McNeese State. Well, go to win that football game by yourself, or get a first down against Northwestern, Northwestern yeah. to allow a, a a hail mary. Him and Burkhead both. I mean, it's it's and, and Halu. My God, oh, yeah. he's still running against Missouri, <laughs> right? So. Uh, Tommy Hill uh, touched on the newcomers here and what they have brought and back to that swag point we're making. I think we just brought swag to the team, a little more swag. The team already had swag. Uh, we just brought some more little touches in there. Um, that's, that's about it, swag, competitiveness, uh, the mentality again. Uh, coaches always talk about the mentality, and that's, that's what you get from us, the mentality of hard work and competing. So Nebraska was right there originally with Tommy Hill. He ended up going to, to Arizona State. A little bit more from, from Hill on Nebraska and better late than never for him to get to Lincoln. Uh, because I've been was trying to go here uh, when I came out of high school, but the COVID hit, so I couldn't take a visit. I, I got to see the place to go, so I couldn't see the place, so... I had to visit Arizona State and uh, Florida State, and those were the only two options. So I had to pick Arizona State. And uh, coming out of transfer portal, uh, he said the same things to me about uh, being competitive. Uh, you got to earn your starter spot. That's anywhere you go. I ain't worried about that because I'm. Uh, that's my. That's what my mentality at trying to earn a starting spot and keeping it. So you know, COVID shifted things around, but. More so, in Nebraska able to to stay that top of mind. Last sign here from from Tommy Hill, and that is special teams. Do we have time for it? Uh, special teams is, is a place he wants to make an impact. I think I can make a big impact on special teams, uh, like I did at Arizona State. They didn't pit me back there a lot. Uh, they did, but sometimes they didn't kick it to me. They had uh, my friend DJ Taylor back there as well. Uh, I tried to compete with him, still competing, uh, still text him about how I'm gonna have more touchdowns than you this year. Um, but I think I'm going to play a big role in special teams. Uh, I'll play anywhere for the team. Uh, I was talking to a uh, coach about punt, uh, punt return, kickoff, kick return, just other stuff like that. I think I can make a big impact on every special team. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. What final time this hour? More thoughts on the spring game. Coach Charlie McBride, a Monday with Charlie. Well, Get you set up for Carolina, Kansas. As Tom Penders, Hall of Fame basketball coach, going to be with us. Big Red Baseball feeling good about themselves. Husker basketball with a new assistant. We'll get to meet tomorrow. That's big. So minus four is the number for Kansas and uh, Carolina tonight. You got to lean. We'll have to probably do a steak and a beer. A little bit later on. I like Hubert. I'm not a Roy guy. I really like this Carolina team. Uh, I don't dislike Bill Self. I just want a great ball game. That's that's my hope. Give me 2.0 of Saturday night Carolina Duke. Mm, can we yeah. can we get that where it's just back and forth and a game of runs and incredible shot after incredible shot. And as many times as Carolina, they're working on a sixth title tonight, but I think 17 or 18 Final Fours. KU's up there with, they're in the teens with Final Fours. Does it wow you KU only has three championships? Think about that. Think about that, and they did it with, I think, Wilt and Dean Smith's team. Then they did it with Danny and the Miracles in 88. 
and then the 08 team because they fell short in in 97 with LaFrenz and Jacques Vaughn and, and that squad. And that's that, that team's special because some of us stood in line for ever and ever and ever to get uh, front row at the Devaney Center while we were in college. And someone may have brought me drinks and food, but I, I was there. It wasn't quite camping out in, in Cheshesqueville, but I was there front and center to get to my spot right underneath the basket. First play of the game, back pick, alley-oop. Ray LaFrance slams it down. <laughs> it's like, this is going to be a long day. Because <laughs> up until then, Nebraska had had decent success against Kansas, at least winning in the Devaney Center for probably four or five consecutive years. But not that 97 team. They were nuts. 96-97. I guess, sure, it surprises me, but... With three, I mean, you look at it, March Madness is, it, it's the, to me, the, the hardest championship to win in college sports. I agree. I, I think March Madness, college basketball is, is number one, followed probably by college baseball. Whenever you look at the, the postseason setup, just to make it to the College World Series and then the, the grind that is the College World Series, that's probably second hardest than football and third. But the college basketball is such a, an, an incredibly difficult national title to win that I, I don't think I can... Say, oh, like, oh, Kansas, what a bunch of underachievers. They only have three. I don't think I can say that. But I, I will say for my, for my lean tonight, I think Carolina is the, the grittier basketball team. They're the team that's more willing to fight. The only thing that worries me is they, they're really happy to just play seven or eight guys. Their starters are probably going to be playing 35-plus minutes tonight. And, I mean, you saw what happened whenever Manic got ejected against uh, Baylor, mm-hmm. where, I mean, North Carolina, it was scary hours for them whenever, or, well, whenever Baylor started they, they coming back. They a lost one lead. Guy. So that's what worries me tonight is, does North Carolina get into some foul trouble oh, with that? I mean, did any sort of injury. I mean, we know Baycott's playing on a, on a bum ankle. So mm-hmm. any sort of that worries me. That's why I think my lean is probably Kansas. I'm going Kansas as well. And, and this may sound really idiotic, but you just beat your rival in an incredible all-time game. And you still got one more to play for the title. That's why you do it all. But you, you, you got Kansas waiting there for you. So we'll see. If, if Hubert can get his guys cross that finish line, wow. Absolute wow. Charlie McBride's next. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Thanks for spending time. It's Hale Varsity Radio, Monday edition, hour two. We say hi to Mr. Black Shirt, a Monday with Charlie, Mr. Charlie McBride. Coach, how we doing? How's the weather? Oh, it's beautiful. Sun's out. You know, it's one of those days we had yesterday where the sun's out. It was beautiful and snowing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can't win them all. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're praying for the wind to go away as we oh, try please. and uh, yeah right try and survive spring baseball season. You know, I tell you, and that that's not funny because you know back in the old days, one of the reasons that we ran the football so much is because of that the stuff. You know, it's hard to throw the ball or kick the ball and doing a lot of those things when the wind's really blowing. So, you know, we we probably were you know. Probably a little ahead of ourselves, but but that's what we did. That was part of it was because of the wind and weather. Well, you got to survive the elements. I mean, those right. th- those rare crazy days where it's seventy and no wind. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Keep the ball. Don't let them have it. I got to ask you, who you're rooting for tonight? Do you have your Carolina blue on or your rock chalk red? Well, I have to go with KU. I, you know, this you have to do that. I mean, it's. Um, I don't. I don't have any problem with that one. Okay, you a little bummed out for your uh, South Side buddy uh, on Saturday night? No, he's. A, you know, as much as he's done, and and you know, when you get beat by what, what? How many points? Four. Not. That, 
Yeah, I mean, come on, it. You know, it's that, that's not the biggest beating I've ever heard of. <laughs> no, <laughs> and it was not, it was a great game. He should, yeah, he should be he should be proud of himself. I don't I don't care. He's done so much for you know not only college but basketball in general. Charlie McBride's with us on Monday with Charlie Hale Varsity Radio. Coach, how did you look at the spring game? Uh, as a coach and as a as a leader on the defense, what was your emotion like once that spring game finally ended? I didn't like any part of it. <laughs> Milt Fennifer and I always had the other team. That's just, somebody else seemed to always get the team that won. In fact, over 23 years, um, the one game that we won was when we had Turner Gill as the quarterback. That was that was it. And we actually, Tom tried to, I think at the time, move him over to the first team or something like that. And we we, we didn't do it. <laughs> so that's how kind of how we won. We we kind of cheated but that you know we 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 had um uh ones and threes against twos and fours it was pretty simple and um i remember a couple of times we ran the clock at the last in the last um quarter a little bit um if i'm not mistaken but overall it was pretty much of a you know straight game uh a lot of of course, you didn't tackle the quarterback. That's one guy you left alone a little bit. And but other than that, it was uh, you know we ran a few blitzes every once in a while. And the thing that happened with that was is when we planned the blitzes, we told the offense what they were, and of course they worked on them during the week. <laughs> so, so that didn't work very good. But but anyway, it uh, uh, it was it was always a lot of fun. I mean, it you know the the players enjoyed it, and it gave the kids in uh, threes and fours a chance to you know really play football, you know, and which which I liked because uh, they had a lot of fun doing it. Coach, now due to injury, Nebraska is finalizing some things where it may <laughs> where it may be just offense versus defense. Because you know, Scott wants it to be a, a game where you you try and go win, right? But due to injury and personnel, maybe it is just going to be offense or defense. Do you like that? Well, yeah, uh, yeah you know, there's, you know, you can talk yourself into injuries too. I, I, we we never seem to. Of course, if a kid's hurt, you're not going to play him. I mean, that's that's simple. But, um, you know, you move kids up to where they, if somebody gets hurt, those kids get the, that were down a little bit get to move up and feel good about themselves and maybe get a chance to show what they can really do in a game situation. Um, but uh, I think, I think the, the whole thing was I don't remember anybody that I can think of that was lost for the year or something like that in the spring game. I, I'm, that may, I'm sure that if George Sullivan was still alive, he'd probably be on the phone right now. But um, I don't, I don't remember anybody that, that that happened to. I, they take care of each other. There's some things you don't do in the spring game that they, they, they play against each other, but they don't cut and they don't do a lot of, you know, things they'd probably do in a regular game. Coach, when you look at this uh, this spring, you've got a lot of new faces, not only at quarterback, but we we listened to Tommy Hill a little bit last hour. He's a defensive back from Arizona State, the Trey Palmer uh, transfer from LSU. Can Can guys bring – energy and some excitement to the team if, if they're transferring in? Is that something that was common when you'd have a guy come in, or is that something that's that's pretty unique? I, I, I just think it has to do a lot with, you know, with uh, the makeup of the team a lot of times. A lot of times there's, a, you know, some guys that think they're going to be at that position, and all of a sudden uh, somebody comes in and takes it away from them. I you know that doesn't help. I don't think it right away. But when you're at a, a, a situation maybe like they are in the secondary now, 
I would think that you know that would be uh, you know uh, really a good a good thing and and the same thing really at quarterback you hate to see the two younger guys get set back because I think they're both good players mm-hmm. but um, but you know that's you know I think they both are realistic and understand what's going on. And if there's a need for something, we did, we we we've gone after I think kickers and tight ends and things like that in junior college, but they came in and we needed them. I mean, we did, you know that's that was the that was the main thing, and uh, maybe not quite as many of them, but you know it's you know it 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 can be a little distracting to some and probably not to others. Coach Charlie McBride's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, and Coach, this weekend, Nebraska's going to have a pretty big visitor in town. That's O'Shawn Mathis. Uh, He has made uh, all big 12 teams twice at his time at TCU. He's going to be transferring for one season to go play uh, college ball elsewhere. He's going to be in Lincoln on Saturday checking out the spring game. Uh, I want to get your take. He's an outside linebacker, defensive end type, uh, does a good job getting after the quarterback. And and I I want to get – your opinion on, on how important that is to a defense. I mean, sounds like Nebraska's got some, some good younger guys coming up in the secondary room. You, you know what they have at linebacker, but the defensive line is still the, the big question mark for this team this next year. So how, how important yeah. is it to have a guy who's a proven pass rusher? Well, you know, I just hear that there's going to be some changes in the defense, and it may be that they're, you know, they, they're going to play some even front, and, and maybe that would uh, – put some of those outside backers, uh, you know, with a chance to rush the passer and put some real speed out there. You know, that's that's the only thing. I mean, if there was a change, you know, in that way. Uh, uh, and, you know, there, there's there been word just thrown around a little bit. And so I don't know how big a deal that really is because you hear most of the time you're hearing about the offense and uh, – which is true. I mean, which is was the same when we were playing. I think people are really interested in the quarterbacks, receivers, and so forth. And you know that um, you know the defensive backs and things were are, are a very important thing. I think is is the spring game. I think all of all, everybody wants to see these these newer guys play. And I think that's the big thing in the spring game now, as far as the fans are concerned. But uh, you know, when 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 you get right down to it, um, bringing bringing players in and doing things like that that can work both ways. It's hard for them to get to know everybody. I mean, I even brought it up in meetings that you know before we played a game. I said, "There's some guys in here don't even never even talk to somebody, you know, each other." And so there's some there's there's a lot of things that go on, and I that's why I always encourage the older guys to really get with those younger guys and and you know be assertive to them, and because uh, the younger guys it's a little harder to go just walking right up to older guys and talk. So the older guys were always you know um, I put the pressure on them a little bit to, to you know to eat with them and talk to them and. Walk up to them and in, and introduce yourself for Pete's sake. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You're all on the same team. You got 100 and what 50 guys out there, and it's hard to know everybody for sure. Charlie McBride's with us, coach. Few minutes uh, to follow up on on the pass rush question. That that's uh-huh. a missing element uh, with this defense was pretty good early against the run. You got to be good all season long stopping the run. Uh, in the Big Ten and in football in general, but getting after the quarterback, more pressure on the quarterback. How often well, did you I, I did, that, did you work on the on the uh, on the pass rush drill, Coach? When it came to developing uh, uh, that element, how how much time did you get, and how much work did you put in with guys? Well, uh, you know, we we kind of looked at spring uh, preseason a little bit a little bit different in that. Uh, most of our most of our running uh, drills and so forth were done in the morning, and our pass rush stuff was at least with alignment. Now sure. I'm talking, yeah. I you know I can't speak for the other guys, but we worked pretty hard on, the, on the, working with each other and 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 pairing them off. And when we got kids, we knew kids were tired and stuff. We kind of paired them off and let them show each other what they're doing. I mean, in other words. The off defensive guy would show him his, his rush, and then they we'd switch around so that everybody got a little bit of different something different, mm-hmm. and because uh, they all didn't use the same techniques, 
we 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 had a lot of different ones, and then a lot of it had to do with height, mm-hmm. you know, and thing and speed and things like that. So it it worked it worked for us really well. Like you know, in other words, in the afternoon was more pass orientated, and morning was more run. What would I'm going to throw out some guys that you coached and what made them special when it came to getting after the quarterback. I'm going to start with Tre- with Trev Alberts. What what made Trev such a, a good uh, edge guy to get after the quarterback? Well, first of all, it starts up on top. How <laughs> smart you! Are. Sure, you know. I mean, it really does. You you have to do some things and and study them. Is is really important. But it, you know, the things you have to be, you, you have to have balance. Explosiveness is huge. Um, you know, you can't stop in a hole, and, and you got to be consistently going toward the quarterback. And, you know, we push that part of it, which is a very simple part. But once you're stopped, then, you gotta, then you're in a position to start jumping for the ball and maybe knocking it down or something. But, and you're kind of assuming that the guys maybe beat you a little bit, and, but you still have to be in position to, make, to react to the quarterback run and those other things. Um, some of the some of the things that you know when I wanted kids to really, really rush the passer, uh, I would I would just tell them, okay, every play's a pass and play the run on the way to the quarterback, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and um, you know that that motivated some. Um, and then we had some calls which would give us a chance to break their gaps of responsibility and. You know, and try to they'd stay in their gaps, but they would play the technique as penetration uh, techniques and try to get, you know, to the passer. And so, you know, it worked. It worked at uh, keeping your eyes on the quarterback all the time while you're while you're rushing the passer. I think your eyes, your peripheral vision, um, as you know, the the offensive linemen have their back to the quarterback, and a lot of times the quarterback will move, and the offensive lineman puts himself in a bad position because he's not sure where the quarterback is or where he's supposed to be. Because you always teach those offensive linemen to have their tails nailed to the quarterback, mm-hmm. you know that they're, you know, good and squared up, and you know able to go either way. But if a quarterback moves out of the pocket, then that changes. Coach, about a minute before we got to say goodbye, you picking the red or the white? Well, I'm, I'm partial to the white. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they'll get another win. If we're going for the defense, then you know I'm going to stick no, with them. I, good for you. A, if it's a regular game, then I'm sticking with the same old guys that I ever coached because hoping those upset will come. <laughs> and uh, you know, you look at a lot of these games, and uh, some of these some of these teams get get it fixed so that the right team wins because mm-hmm. the other team is doing pretty well. So, but it it gives everybody a chance to play, and that that's the important thing. Well, nothing like uh, getting ready for a spring game and then having old To rage your team. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for <laughs> well, I get fired up about the spring game. I mean, everybody did. It was a, you know, it was a, it was a real, you know, a, a really important to our players. Well, that's that's good, Coach. We'll get your thoughts on on Saturday uh, next Monday. All right, you have a good weekend and keep, I'll do it. Keep out of that wind. All right. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be on T Big Ten Network, so we'll get a chance to see it. Yeah, it'll, so it'll, I guess them and Purdue are going to be on this weekend. So That'll be good. We'll see how she goes. Coach, you take care. Okay. Thanks for the time today. Thanks for having me. I'll see you next week. I'll talk to you. See you, Coach. Okay, bye now. And we're back. Fellas, I think we could... Listen to the radio listen. On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Back into it, Hale Varsity Radio. It is Championship Monday, and tell you what, a couple of programs you know a ton about, specifically all those years at the Devaney Center with Kansas coming into town. A guy who visited the Devaney Center a few times with his running horns team, Hall of Fame coach, and... Uh, uh, standout uh, five teams to the NCAA tournament, an Elite Eight, 
Tom Penders with us at Tom Penders on Twitter is where you follow him. Coach, uh, what a what a march it has been. How are you? I'm doing great, Chris, and I agree. I I think this is a great tournament. Uh, you've got everything in it. You know, you've got the the underdog, the you know, the St. Peter's going all the way to the Elite Eight. And, you know, they finally hit North Carolina, uh, who didn't seem to care whether they were the <laughs> Cinderella or not. They uh, pretty much handled them. But that was the only game, you know, that <clears throat> excuse me, that Carolina could say, well, that was a, a breather <laughs> because they had to play all the other big guys. Being a nine seed, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to – to beat the one seed and, and, and the high seeds that they've had to go through. Uh, but, you know, you've got in that now you get to the final four and you have four heavyweights. Uh, you know, some people call them blue bloods. Uh, you know, I don't know about that, but, you know, you had four name teams, uh, all outstanding teams to get to the final four. For some people, that's great. Other people like to see the underdogs in the Final Four. Uh, to me, uh, this is a great classic matchup in this final. You've got Kansas, a perennial power that's been here before. Bill Self is a, a great coach, not a good one. He's a great one. And you've got rookie coach Hubert Davis, who comes into Carolina uh, everybody's expecting them to have a so-so year, maybe over 500. There was no predictability for North Carolina to do what they did. So they are, I guess, a sleeper. But it's hard for me to call North Carolina a sleeper. I watched them very carefully in their last eight games of the season. And I don't know why that's not a criteria uh, for the, you know, the committee to choose teams and seed teams, you know, your last eight, ten games, whatever they decide is the number, you know, to me tells whether a team is, you know, properly seeded, has a chance to make a Final Four or a Sweet 16. And nobody was picking Carolina to do what they did. So, you know, hats off to Hubert Davis. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, Roy Williams, uh, said that you know he wasn't used to coaching such little talent at North Carolina, and some of these guys now are juniors and seniors that have taken uh, Hubert Davis to the Final Four, and uh, hats off to him too for in the middle of the season uh, losing to Wake Forest by like 40 points, and it was an embarrassing loss. The second one second blowout loss for Carolina, which doesn't happen. And Hubert Davis, you know, told the nation and everybody who listened that he wasn't happy with this and he was going to turn things around. These guys were going to get tougher and they were going to be like the old North Carolina teams. And some people thought, you know, he, he's a little over his skis here in saying that, but he did it. And you have to you have to give him a lot of credit for taking this team all the way to the final game. And I pick he's going to win the whole thing tonight. He could. Tom Penders with us. Coach, I want to go back to Saturday night, a instant classic with Duke and North Carolina. You are so close with Coach K. Let me ask you this. Is he watching tonight's game? Oh, boy. <laughs> Probably not. Um, you know, if he followed my practice uh, when we played in the tournament, whether you lose in the final game or the Elite Eight game or the game to get you to the Final Four, which is the Elite Eight game, it, it's tough. When you lose in the tournament, it's like your best friend died mm. for about a week. And then you kind of taper off. Uh, you think about next year. But with Coach K, and I, you know, went through a similar thing in my last year of coaching at Houston, 
When I took over there in 2004, pick for last in the American Conference, which is now the American Conference. It's Conference USA, basically. They put a new title on it. But we had Memphis in that league, and, and number 23, UTEP that year. Uh, but we won the conference tournament. We represented uh, the conference as the champion. Uh, but then we had the matchup with a great Maryland team with Gary Williams, Hall of Famer coach. And he didn't take me lightly because we've coached against each other with other schools. Uh, and, and we got knocked off. And quite frankly, I didn't, didn't come to, so to speak, after that until the final round uh, where it got down to four teams. Uh, even when you lose in the opening round, I, I think coaches take it hard when you lose that last game of the season. You know you're never going to coach this team again. Uh, and, and your players, there's a lot of emotion involved. Those Duke players, uh, they did a fantastic job this year in, in Coach K's final season. But, you know, Mike is a legend. He's accomplished so much. Uh, and when somebody stops and, and tells him what he's done with his career, not that he needs to hear it from somebody else, but what a career. I don't think anybody's ever going to match what Mike Krzyzewski's done, uh, and nothing's going to change him. Uh, Mike seemed very gracious after the ball game, uh, but it hurt losing to Carolina uh, for the second time in, in a couple of weeks. They lost to them in the conference finals a couple of weeks earlier. And they also lost, um, you know, another game. So, you know, when you beat a great team like Duke a couple of times, like North Carolina has in the last month, you know, they, that had to give them confidence uh, or has to give them confidence going into, into tonight. I don't expect a letdown of uh, you know, unless somebody snaps their f- fingers in front of Brady Manick. Uh, <laughs> or shave his beard, uh, his magic beard, right? Yeah, they picked him up in a trade or a draft pick in the portal. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, he didn't do a whole lot during the season uh, until mid-February. And all of a sudden, he started knocking down three-point shots. And he's still, you know, he's catching shooting. He. He took a, a three-point attempt the other night where he was sideways to the basket, had no view of the basket, spun around, and knocked down a three, uh, and it had ice on it. <laughs> it. It was such a high arc, on uh, and just splash. It hit nothing but net right in front of his own bench. So, uh, you know, if Manic has another good night, I think it's good night. For Kansas. Now, Kansas is, is a very good team, but it's not the best team Bill Self has ever brought to a Final Four. He seems to overachieve with teams that aren't predicted to be great. This is a thin team, not a team with a lot of depth. They go like seven uh, men in their rotation. Carolina only uses seven, maybe eight maximum. So you, you've got two teams that know their rotation, uh, and, and the coaches know it too. I expect a great game tonight. I don't expect a whole hummer, uh, a, a game where somebody gets blown out. I just think these teams are, are on a crest, uh, and you know we should see a great final game tonight. Coach, do you wonder if, I mean, with North Carolina only having those seven guys, do you worry about, you know, a, a physical national title game where they start racking up some fouls and some guys have to start going to the bench? Because that, to, to me, seems like the, 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 the best way for Kansas to go win this game is to, to be physical and use your depth, in a sense, to, to be able to, to outclass this North Carolina team. Well, I don't see, uh, you know, one man, McCormick, uh, being able to battle those guys up front, not Baycott and company, the forwards that North Carolina has, very athletic. They attack the offensive board. You're going to see three guys right from the beginning of the game 
going after every rebound on every shot. And that puts a lot of stress on Kansas to box out, box out hard without fouling. If the game is called squeaky tight, let's say let's go back to a game that I keep dwelling on, I guess, but Texas against Purdue, 49 foul shots to 12. Two physical teams, two teams from conferences that are known for physicality, uh, but the game was called lopsided, in my opinion, and they were looking at one team and not the other. I think you're going to see a better officiated game. You know, you've got to let certain things go. Uh, you have to have officials that are going to call things that are meaningful. No ticky-tack fouls tonight in the finals. Uh, make sure that if somebody fouls out, there are no questionable calls. I know that's on the official's mind. I'm sure whoever is the supervisor of officials, I'm not that in tune with it now. I know Dan Gavitt's over college basketball, and somebody answers to him on this. I expect to see a really evenly matched game and a well-officiated game as well. Tom Penders with his Hall of Fame basketball coach, long time at Texas, Rhode Island, Houston, Go down the list, and he went dancing uh, five times, five different teams to the NCAA tournament. He's joining us here to preview the championship game tonight. You'll hear it right here on ESPN Lincoln locally. Our friends out in central Nebraska, Superstation, Tri-Cities, uh, Duda and crew will have the coverage as well on Westwood One. Uh, so that is in Kansas and Carolina. More thoughts from Coach as he'll hang on the line with us. A reminder about buckling up, hands on the wheel, eyes and mind straight ahead. The driver, one job to drive safely. Buckle up, a message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. John Penders with his Hall of Fame coach. Five teams to the dance, previewing North Carolina and Kansas. So, Coach, when we look at some X factors tonight. You mentioned the front line of Carolina, Baycott, how, I mean, 21 rebounds the other night against Duke was incredible. Some second chance opportunities. Love has been unconscious with big shot taking and making. Baji was on fire Saturday as well. So it comes down to what? You mentioned rebounding, but if KU wins, who's, who's stirring the drink? If it is a Carolina night, who's going to be uh, going to be uh, incredible. Has it got to be Love again, do you think? Who are, who are the, the X Factors? Yeah, Love has been playing really well and shooting the basketball uh, extremely well. He's a mid-range shooter who can knock down threes as well as the mid-range. He directs the attack. Uh, he's not a turnover-prone guard. Uh, I think backcourts win in, in the NCAA tournament. If you have a good backcourt, uh, you have a chance to win. They take care of the ball for you. They get the ball where it should go. Uh, and and both teams have very good guard play. But I have to give the edge to Carolina because their backcourt has really been solid. Now, Abaji coming on and playing the way he did the last game, if he can put this game uh, you know, in the same category, if, if, if he has another great game, Kansas will be in it and has a really good chance to win it. He's the key. He's the straw that stirs the drink for Kansas. Uh, they, they've won games without him playing well. Uh, but if you'll remember, and if you, this was a key game. Uh, when they lost at Texas, Chris Beard put in a special defense where they were face guarding Abaji. Uh, I don't know if uh, Hubert Davis is going to do that. Uh, but he might have to if Abaji plays the way he did in his last game. Uh, you know, if, if he's on fire and they get a, a good game from McCormick where he's not in foul trouble, and that that is a major thing. And I know Bill Self is worried about it because when you face a team that hits the offensive boards, that's where most of the fouls come on the interior, not in boxing out, not in the rebound itself but challenging the putback shot. 
that's where you get the cheap fouls and the you know the guy going maybe for a block or a deflection. You know he hits the hand or the arm, and that's where you get the cheap calls. So that's I think a major concern for Bill Self uh, tonight is that he gets in foul trouble because they really don't have a backup for McCormick uh, that they can go out there and, and, and give it the same, you know, the rebounding and the, and the offense that, that he gives. He's an old school center and he, you know, he scores all of his points near the basket. And so is Armando Baycott. Uh, it'll be a war between those two and the front courts of both teams. There's going to be a lot of stress on the Kansas front, front court in this game because of what Carolina does on the offensive mm-hmm. boards. Coach, uh, you're a Vegas guy. You always get out to Vegas to see your friends and watch a little basketball during the NCAA tournament. Over, under, on the number of camera shots of Roy Williams tonight. <laughs> That's a beauty. Uh, <laughs> take, just take the over. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's there in that Carolina and uh, Carolina blue and white sweater, and uh, he's, he's you have he's one of those in the ride. You have one of those in burnt orange. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I've got a bunch of burnt orange stuff. Not that they put me in their Hall of Fame there at Texas. I'm all orange now. Now, you, now you'll wear it. <laughs> But we won't see Roy Williams cry at the end of this tournament, which was a tradition. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, will Roy cry after this one? (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) But I'm sure it's going through his mind that, wow, this guy isn't so bad after all, because Baycott, who's the star of this team, uh, he was on that team too, the team that, Finished below 500, and Cole Anthony was the point guard. He's a starter now for the Orlando team and the NBA. They had great talent on that team, but a coach who only knew one style of offense and one style of defense, Hubert Davis has changed everything. Mm-hmm. Carolina is now an aggressive team. They're not a soft team. I used to say that Roy Williams' teams in the last few years were playing with tuxedos on. <laughs> I mean, they weren't out there banging and 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 uh, attacking the way this team does. So, I think you know we t- talk about change of culture. Uh-huh. That's that's what Hubert Davis has brought to this Carolina team. That's what that's what it takes. You know, having turned seven different programs around immediately when I coach, uh, there's a little bit of a trick to that. It's embracing the returning players, even if they're new to you. Uh, they help you in recruiting, and if you treat them right, you're going to get maximum effort and production from them, and that's just what Hubert Davis has mm-hmm. done. It's not an influx of new players or one-and-done freshmen for Carolina. This is a veteran ball club uh, that's been on a mission throughout this tournament. Coach, what was – what was it like going up against Roy on the recruiting trail? You got a story for us? Well, you know, he was always – when you're at Kansas <laughs> uh, and you're in the same conference, it's pretty hard to beat him in recruiting. But the, we did recruit some kids uh, that he recruited. Uh, we got them, and he kept recruiting them when they were at Texas. So I'm not really fond of of Roy Williams and his methods, in case you haven't gleaned that from my conversations in the past. I I knew that Um, he was not a Christmas card guy, but I just didn't know the (laughs) severity. He sends sends Christmas cards to players he recruited, even if he didn't land them. Uh And, and, uh, you know, after games, when you play them, he's talking to the parents, that type of thing. You know, I might wave and say hi to somebody, but I'm not going to go and spend 10 minutes with parents of a player at another school. But that was commonplace for Roy Williams and Matt Doherty, his top assistant. Uh, So, no, I wasn't wild about it. I I call it an ethical violation. Uh, You know, coaches should never do that. Mm -hmm. You have to respect the other coach. 
Uh, and, and certainly it's a great way to make enemies when you do stuff like that. Coach, well, enjoy the championship game tonight. It's been just awesome having you back on with us throughout the NCAA tournament. We always love your insight, and uh, we will uh, get caught up again. Stay uh, safe and healthy, Coach, and appreciate your time as always. Well, thank you, Chris. It's always great being on with you, and uh, hopefully Husker Nation has uh, an opportunity to play in it next year. Uh, I'll make a prediction Fred Hoiberg is going to turn it around next year. Well, let's uh, Nebraska basketball fans want to see it. There's a lot of love for Fred. Got a new assistant he'll introduce tomorrow, and we'll uh, we'll see what direction they go. The arrow can only point up. It's been rough. So Fred's a good dude, a smart coach, and uh, let's see if they get uh, get some better breaks and some better play. Coach, we'll talk soon, and best to you, sir. Okay. Have a, have a great night tonight. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Going to be a good week, and we kick it off the right way. NCAA Championship tonight, Kansas, Carolina. We'll tell you... The breakdown betting-wise, uh, we will have the Pirate this week. Mike Leach going to join us. Uh, we'll check in with Eddie Markowski tomorrow. Jabba Chamberlain, Searles, Jay Moore. I mean, and by the way, we're at the Single Barrel. So go get yourself a steak and a beer on Friday down at the Single Barrel. Come say hi to us, 4 to 6 Roadshow Friday. And then again, 9.30 to 11.30. Come on back for breakfast. Uh, that uh, breakfast buffet's money right in front of the, uh, the spring game kickoff at 1. So Mattress Mac, he's a uber-successful Houston furniture store owner. He has fallen short in some of the more high-profile monster sporting events. All Jimbo has bet tonight is $3.3 million on KU to take it all. Money line? Money line? So he's, he's, not, he's not messing with the spread. I don't blame him. I don't blame him because I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of with him here where I think Kansas this pulls it out. plays through the sports book. He got Jayhawks plus 190. Plus 190? Mm-hmm. Oh, so he, he must have taken this when the Final Four started. Mm-hmm. Wow, okay. So then that's a, that's a pretty good little bet for him, to be honest with you. I don't hate that. And, and he, let's be honest. Could have earned him $6.27 million. Uh, Let's be honest. I don't think he cares if he wins or loses this bet. He, we're talking about him. <laughs> we're talking about him. Everyone else from the country is talking mm-hmm. about him. And we wouldn't be talking about him if he wasn't placing these crazy bets. We wouldn't be talking about his business either. People go, how does he get all this money? Well, let's look into what business he runs. And boom, it's free, Furniture. free PR for him. So he doesn't care if he wins or loses. He's willing to throw down the big money. But I think that's a good bet. KU's favored by four over under 152. I'm staying away from the four. Absolutely. I think this thing hits over, don't you? Yeah, I think this is a score fest. Same here. Uh, You have the total points, 74.5 for KU uh, is the number. And most outstanding player, plus 500. This is per DraftKings. You have uh, Baycott or Caleb Love. They're going off at plus 500. The uh, winning margin, either team by five, that's plus 165. Mm. See, I, I don't think I'll have time to make it up to the, the sports books up in Council Bluffs, but if I did... What if I could get you a guy? <laughs> <laughs> Will he break my kneecaps? <laughs> no, I, maybe, but you, you're not ever a welcher. No, but, but my, my question is, you said Kansas team total over 74 and a half. Mm-hmm. That's the line, so that means North Carolina should be at 70 and a half? Yeah. Take the over on that. That, 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 I think that's the smart bet for the night is North Carolina over 70 and a half points. I think both these teams it, it'll, it'll live in the 70s. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. KU has been really good. They've been great in the first. They've won a lot of halves where they've just been dominant. The last three games, they've won a half. Clearly, they've won, but they've absolutely outclassed their opponent in the second half of the Miami game. Uh, what they did to Nova to start off was fantastic. Carolina just has it with their three-point shooting. And they've, it's not necessarily been about selection, but more so about timing. Does KU get it done? I hope KU gets it done. 
pulling for the Jayhawks. Give me KU 79, Carolina 72. Okay, I, I got KU uh, covering the line as well, 83 to 75. I think North Carolina hangs tough, but Kansas pulls away late. Enjoy the ball, t- ball game tonight. More thoughts tomorrow on Hale Varsity.